Hello, Father Rich coming to you from the hallway in the rectory of the second floor, right outside of Father Shane's room, in front of our exercise room. Father Dave and Father, or my room, are down here as well as a guest room. But I'm here in front of the uh, picture we have of Archbishop Gannon, John Mark Gannon, um, who's the most well-known uh, kind of historic bishop that we've had in the Diocese of Erie. And I do so because the next masterpiece we have is about an archbishop. Now remember, Archbishop Gannon got that title as an honorary title because of the work he had done on the, the national level uh, in the church, not because we're an archdiocese. Typically an archbishop would be the bishop of an archdiocese, which is the metropolitan uh, diocese for a certain area. For example, in uh, Pennsylvania, the archdiocese is Philadelphia. So the archbishop of Philadelphia would be called archbishop and all the other bishops in Pennsylvania would be just called bishops. So, um, but nonetheless, um, this, the, the, the masterpiece is called, it's a novel called Death Comes for the Archbishop by Willa Cather and written in 1927. One of the things that's really fascinating about it is that it's written about a Catholic archbishop out in the Southwest um, New Mexico, Santa Fe. Um, it's a historical fiction novel but um, it was so kind of well-rooted in Catholicism that most people assumed that Willa Cather was a Catholic. Um, and they actually complimented her on that, uh, even in letters and whatnot. But it turns out she was Episcopalian. She grew up in, in a Baptist church, um, was not as excited about the evangelical kind of approach to Christianity, was drawn towards Episcopalianism, was confirmed, uh, I think, as an adult. Uh, as a Catholic, uh, uh, Episcopalian, but had a lot of sympathy for the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. Particularly, she was moved by the work that the, the missions, the missionaries had done in New Mexico, and even seeing the remnant of that in the old um, stucco churches and missions that were still there, even some of them in ruins. And she, when she would go out and visit there, uh, she had been born in, um, I think, the East Coast and then ended up uh, settling in Nebraska, where she grew up, but then spent time going out to the West. And uh, so there was a certain statue of a bishop out in um, out in New Mexico that kind of became, uh, she felt she became connected to, that kind of represented that, that place. Um, it was Archbishop Lamy. And so he would be kind of the model that she would use to tell this story. Uh, about a priest who goes out to New Mexico, eventually becomes archbishop, and just the work he did out there. And his, his you know, they talk about her writing style was very subtle, very kind of paced. Um, and so that was kind of the approach that uh, she had, but she highlighted his faith, kind of just his, um, his constancy, you know, and those were kind of some of the themes that were portrayed in this novel, which really... Uh, celebrates kind of those qualities. Um, another thing that they mention, and even in the book, that um, they certainly were sensitive to, and the Archbishop as well as the, the Willa Cather, the, the writer of the book, to the injustices that had been um, imposed upon the, the Native Americans from colonialism. And so really kind of playing off that, the Archbishop certainly was against that. Um, so before he dies, the bishop in the uh, book, he kind of um, celebrates the fact that he would die having seen two great injustices undone, which were the freedom for, you know, slaves and um, the, uh, for blacks and for the return of land to the, I think it was the Navajo Indians at the time, so uh, Native Americans. So, um so yeah, so the, the, a very moving kind of uh, historical novel that was written. And um, and so this Willa Cather as well, they talk about that um, she kind of had this unique style that uh, they say a quietude and stillness and tone along with an ability to craft achingly beautiful descriptions of landscape and convincing interior monologues. So the stillness the reader finds in her stories, though, is not the stillness of inertia, but of contemplative, nostalgic, and unhurried approach to life and storytelling. Even when the most disturbing or painful things occur in the lives of her characters, she does not ratchet up the drama, but describes them with serene and measured prose, as though writing from a perspective far above the turmoil of human existence. However, this isn't to say that the stories are without motion. They're deeply moving and resonant, made more impactful due to absence of effect. 
So really this kind of unique style that she had um, to tell moving stories, but without getting overly dramatic and emotional. Um, so they kind of say that this last kind of quote from the archbishop in the story kind of summarizes what, uh, you know, what she sees as miraculous in life and just the common things of life. And so this is what she, the bishop would say, when there is great love, there are always miracles, he said at length. Uh, one night almost... One might almost say that an apparition is a human vision connected by divine love. I do not see you as you really are, Joseph. I see through my affection for you. The miracles of the church seem to me, seem to, me to rest not so much upon faces or voices of healing power coming suddenly near, near us from afar off, but upon our perceptions being made finer, so that for a moment our eyes can see and our ears can bear what is there about us always. So this idea that it's not some far off transcendent thing, the divine and the miraculous, but it's really among us and just having that grace to see it, to have that refined vision, to see those moments. And really, you know, that's a gift from God to have that ability to see that. And hopefully we pray to God to be able to look back on our daily lives and see how God is working in very profound ways, even though it might not be in the showy, dramatic, um, you know, it might not be in the showy dramatic uh, lightning or thunder as we see with Elijah experience, but in the, the silent whisper, you know, in the, si in the subtle wind. So a uh, great uh, lesson for us to, to learn from Willa Cather. Uh, she would, you know, write other novels throughout her life. Um, she would always have, you know, sometimes incorporate religious themes. One's called O Pioneers, 1913, one of ours, 1922. Um, she recorded in that book kind of a, a, a religious crisis that was probably at the heart of her conversion in 1922 to um, Episcopalianism. Uh, other books, The Professor's House, 1925, My Mortal em Enemy, 1926. Um, kind of, you know, looking at the despair that can come from putting your life into goals uh, in worldly goals that aren't fulfilling. So she really had some deep, and then she wrote Archbishop Death Comes to an Archbishop in 1927, Shadows on the Rock, 1931. Um, they kind of mention those two have Catholic characters, both of them showing her sympathy for the Catholic faith. Um, but they mentioned that um, she did not, she wasn't, didn't consider herself a Christian writer, but a novelist who wrote about Christian themes sometimes. So she didn't want to be pegged as just a spiritual religious light writer, but it was definitely weaved in throughout her writing. So um, certainly appreciate the, uh, this, uh, the contribution that Willa Cather's made to the literary um, history of our country, and certainly the you know, support she gave in painting the, the Catholic Church in a positive light, even not being a Catholic herself. So thank you for joining me for this masterpiece. Our next one will be next week. The Passion of Joan of Arc. It's a film from 1928 by Carl Theodore Dreher. Thank you again. Have a great day and God bless.